Hi everyone and welcome to In Deep Geek Live. Welcome to the first of a series of pre-show live streams that I'm going to be doing it at this time every week all the way through season eight and I hope you are as excited as I am. We will have a guest on today, a special guest. LML is going to be joining us in just a few minutes. He's finishing off his own live stream and then we'll be jumping on to this one. But I thought what we'd do just to start with is just explain how we're going to be running through this uh, and how this is going to work. Normally, I'm going to roughly split these live streams in half. The first half, we're going to look back at the previous episode. The second half, going to look forward to the episode that's coming. So today, we obviously haven't got one to look back on, so it's just going to be focusing entirely on episode one and the season as a whole. Now, I'm going to be doing two live streams a week. My second one is on my normal Thursday slot. That's at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 11 p.m. UK time. That's going to be one focused for my patrons and Q&A. So that's what that one's going to be. This one is pure q and I'm going to be taking questions from the chat. As always, if there's any super chats, we'll come to them straight away. But I'm hoping to pick up as many questions as we can as we go through. There's been a lot of great uh, questions coming already. Um, and guys, uh, you'll spot uh, quite a few moderators in there already. Uh, they will be moderating the chat as we go through. Okay, guys, um, I'm going to uh, kick off. We did have a couple of super chats just before we got started, so I will get on to them straight away. First, first of all, Maura Lee, thank you so much. Uh, a very generous super chat. Um, uh, you know how much I appreciate your support, Maura, so thank you, saying, in honour of season eight, looking forward to all the episode breakdowns and discussions that will be happening in the next few weeks. Just some love and support for all that you do. Thank you. Thank you, Maura. Um, and uh, Dave Blackham said, uh, hi, Robert, my first ever Super Chat. Thank you. I really appreciate that. I believe we will see quite a lot of bland flash, uh, brand flashback scenes this season. Do you think we will see any in episode one? I think that's a fantastic question. So um, in terms of Bran, yeah, we might. But I think that really the purpose of the brand flashback um, the, the, the flashbacks, the going back in history is for him to find out information. So the question is, is there any extra information we need to find out or that the showrunners want to give us? Now, obviously, what he's been doing so far has been focused around two key events. What was going on around the Tower of Joy and all of that? I don't think that they're going to give us any extra information about that. I don't think that there's any added value for the showrunners in terms of showing us the Battle of the Trident, I would love to see that. But any of this old backstory about what happened uh, 15 or so years ago, I don't think we're going to see much of that. The question, the big question is whether or not we're going to see anything extra about the beginning, way back at the first of the Long Nights when the White Walkers were first created. Now, I think that this is unfortunately far from certain. I think there's a good chance that we could, but also the, there's a feeling that I'm starting to get so that the showrunners are trying to create the idea of the White Walkers um, as we've told you how they are created. They were there, they were created. Uh, Leaf said as much that they were created as a self-defense mechanism against um, humans uh, all that time ago. And um, the, the whole point is that they were there. They were fight against the humans because the humans were invading Westeros. And then um, they turned against their creators at some point. So the children of the forest and humanity came together and uh, what uh, the, they pushed them back. And that was the end of the first long night. I think that is the situation that they have presented to us. Um, and wh whether they feel they need to add to that, I don't know. I hope they do, because I really want a little bit more information about what was going on there, uh, particularly in terms of the motivations, because uh, I think it's been pretty clear they're not going to have the Night King talking to us. We're just going to get the, the swirly symbols that we've had and things like that. It's not going to be a direct conversation saying, oh, yes, well, this is why we're invading and all the rest of it. It really is a matter of whether they want to flesh out their motivations. At the moment, unfortunately, my guess is probably not. That doesn't mean we won't, but I can't see how this is going to uh, add to what the showrunners seem to have told us already. Um, 
Stephen Stark, uh, thank you so much. Uh, $10, that's very kind. Love your work, Robert. I can't usually make it on Thursday nights. Um, really looking forward to being in the chat on Sundays. Also, I pay in your native currency, but I'm having trouble losing pounds. <laughs> uh, well, th thank you very much. That's very kind. Um, it's, uh, it's lovely uh, to any currency, and I really quite enjoy trying to guess what some of the, uh, uh, the currencies are that I don't know uh, when they come through, but thank you so much. Um, I see there's a lot of people already jumping over from LML stream. Uh, we, we tried to uh, get this so that people could watch both of them. Uh, people watched LML stream. You had a lot of fantastic, I nipped on for a little bit, but there were some fantastic guests that he had on there. The chance that they can come over here. He's just going to take a very quick break, uh, just go grab a glass of water or whatever, and then he'll jump on here in a few minutes. So I think what I'd quite like to do is is explain how I kind of break down episode one in my mind. And uh, hopefully this will lead to a few questions because I see this as being in three different areas. The plot is developing in three different areas, one of which is probably going to be largely off screen, which is what's happening with the Night King and the Army of the Dead. Uh, one of which is going to be uh, what is happening down in King's Landing with Cersei. And then the other one is obviously what's going to be happening in Winterfell. And I think we focus a lot of our attention when we're thinking about the early part because of the season, because of what was in the trailers about what's happening in Winterfell. And we'll get onto that in a moment. But I want to spend a few moments just thinking about what the Night King's up to, where he's going to be going with his army. Now, um, I would suggest that what happened north of the wall, when the, the Army of the Dead was north of the wall, that the tactic was to move across and not leave any survivors behind. That seemed to be what was going on. So although we might think, oh, yes, of course, they'll go straight to Winterfell, I don't think that that's what's going to happen. I think that they'll work out, let's go from the north-south slowly. So I imagine that we're going to have places like Castle Black coming under attack. We're going to have places like the last hearth coming under attack. Now, the last hearth we'd never really seen, but if you remember back to last season, there was uh, young Ned Umber, as well as Alice Carstark, who will be obviously going off elsewhere, but uh, they were sort of sent back to their homes. And so I think that this is what we're gonna get in season, in episode one, is this kind of drip drip of information coming back from places elsewhere where the army of the dead are attacking that we might not see. I don't think we're going to see the last half. I think that we'll hear about what happened. With Castle Black, I think it's entirely possible that we will see at least a hint of it, because if we try and think about what happened with, we've got three characters who were at the wall as of the end of last season. Uh, we had Tormund and Beric, who were at Eastwatch. They presumably have survived. We saw them in the trailer. And then we have Ed, who's at Castle Black. Now, we have to ask where Tormund and Beric will go. I think there's two options. They could go to Winterfell. They could go to Castle Black. I suspect that they will head across to Castle Black, meet up with Ed. And I think that will be one of the first places that the Army of the Dead comes. And so actually, probably over episodes one and two, we're going to get this slow uh, movement off screen of where the Army of the Dead is going to go. And uh, we we will get uh, we will see the Castle Black attack not as a big battle scene I don't think just as a something they can't stop Castle Black is not defendable from the south this is the way all of the Night's Watch forts are set up they've got a big wall to the north but to the south there's no wall so uh, they they will probably just have to abandon it and just head on down south. Um, so that's what's going to be happening, I think, with the Night King's army for the first couple of episodes before they get to um, Winterfell for around episode three. Or probably right at the end of episode two. Um, uh, Fiesum uh, uh, Horsbane, uh, thank you so much for the super chat, saying, I don't see a statue of Rob in the crypts. Um, where is Ghost? Um, does the Golden Company have elephants and does the Night King have spiders? Lots of questions. So in terms of does the Night King have ice spiders in the legends that Old Man was telling, then yes, we haven't seen them yet on the show. I hope I would love to see them uh, on the show. Does the Golden Company have elephants? That's certainly the rumour in the books. They certainly do. We'll have to wait and see whether or not, uh, frankly, they have the budget and care for them to have elephants on the show. Um, I suspect that they may not. Um, 
uh, if they were focusing their budget on dragons and direwolves, for example. Um, where is Ghost? Oh, I hope Ghost makes a, an appearance. I really do. It would make no sense to me whatsoever if Ghost does not appear this season. Um, don't see a statue of Rob. No. So Rob's bones were in uh, down in River Run. So that is where we last saw them. Um, we have. <laughs> we have a guest coming in. I'll finish my sentence and then introduce him. Um, we we have not heard that they've come up to Winterfell, which is why we do not have a statue. But our special guest is here, LML. He's uh, serenading us. Wow. Uh, I, won't, I won't go on. I just this is my funny way of interrupting you, I guess. That, that it was elegant as always uh, and looking as dapper as you always do as well uh, guys if you do not know LML uh, my good friend he's got his own channel uh, Lucifer Means Lightbringer I popped over to his channel for his live stream and he's returning the favour and coming over here but LML do you want to just introduce yourself first of all uh, well my go by LML that stands for Lucifer Means Lightbringer and I talk about symbolism and mythology most of you guys know me uh, you can find all my stuff at luciferMeansLightbringer.com and on the Lucifer Light Means Lightbringer YouTube channel. See, it's kind of long and hard to say. That's why I go by LML. Much easier. But let's not talk about me. Let's talk about Game of Thrones season eight. That's what we're all here for. I saw you talk. I heard you talking about Night King. That's a yeah, pretty fun so topic. I'm definitely dying to see what's up with Night King this year. Ab absolutely. So, so what I was sort of saying is, I see three different sections to this episode. Um, there's what's happening with the Night King and the Army of the Dead. That's going to be largely off screen, though uh, I think we need to be aware of what his movements are. There's what's happening with Cersei uh, down in King's Landing that I think we should touch on because when we haven't been focusing on that, I think, in the fandom all that much, focusing on Winterfell. And obviously there's what's going on in Winterfell. Um, we'll come back to the Night King in just one moment. We did get a super chat from uh, Merit of Abydos. Thank you so much. Very kind saying uh, thanks for your great work. Thank you. What do you think will be the role of the crypts in the show? Now I've talked lots about the crypts. If you've watched my videos, you know I've got many theories. I think that this is going to work differently on the show uh, than I think it will in the books. But uh, LML, what do you, oh you're looking away. What do you think about the crypts? Uh, just silencing my phone, brother, making sure it doesn't go off, just like at the movies. I think the Crips is going to be almost like a replay of Blood Raven's Cave. Not that it will necessarily turn out the same way, but I really got that vibe in the promo when they showed the cold frost in the Crips and all the characters in the Crips. You really get the feeling like it's going to be the same thing. We're going to see Night King and the, uh, and the White Walkers stalking down the hallways. And, you know, whether it's you know, a lot of people think that Arya chase scene might be Arya, you know, leading Night King around. Azora Hype blew up the photo uh, and and it does look kind of like Night King in the shadows there that possibly, you know, he'll be in there. So the question is, as far as like the dead spirits raising, um, you know, it's always one of those things, Robert, in the book that we've talked about a lot. Joe Magician and I have talked about it a lot, I've talked about it with Emmett and, you know, will there be this... Uh, Lord of the Rings moment when the spirits of the dead Starks rise to either fight for the living or perhaps under the thrall of Night's King or the White Walkers. And it just seems, it always seems like a little bit too far out of an idea. But at the same time, we know that the level of magic in the story is increasing as we reach the end. And we know that George is a skilled writer who can pull off stuff that you might think would be hard to pull off. So I don't know. I definitely think that the show is going to do less with it in that sense. Like meaning if the books are going to really raise those spirits, the show probably won't. Um, I've suggested that maybe there'll be like John or Bran will, will sense the old spirits of the Kings of winter in a dream and they'll lend them strength in, in a way, but something less than actual like resurrection, but we'll get a sense that like the old Stark spirits are giving power to Bran or something like that. What do you think of that? Yeah, I mean, I, I love that. Uh, just Dark Mother, thank you so much. $6.66, LML, it's your number. Uh, Mythheads follow each other around. Uh, that's the name of uh, LML's community, the Mythheads. Um, yeah, so I think that they will underplay the crypts, or at least I think that it will be a cool location rather than a hugely spiritual, magical thing. I think that's where it is. In the books... I agree completely. I've done a couple of videos. I think that the uh, the the Stark dead 
will rise and be uh, be fighting for the Starks, for the living, as it were. On the show, I think it's probably going to flip, actually. If anything, then the, the people raising dead Starks, that's going to be the Night King. And I think that what we're going to see, they've done a lot of parallels to the Battle of uh, Helm's Deep. I think that that is the equivalent of uh, the, the bicker bit at the back where everybody's hiding out at Helm's Deep where uh, the last uh, people survivors are going to be and then they're going to try and make an escape away from that. So I think that's what it is. I love the idea of the, the Stark Dead rising, but I can only see them happening in the show in the context of the uh, the Night King raising them. One thing that I will say, Robert, is um, the more important, you know, we love the magic and the stuff, but the heart and conflict is always number one. And the crypts have always been a very important place emotionally and thematically for the Starks and for John, for RLJ, for Ned. And so I am glad that the show is definitely has picked that up and is using the crypts as a location, um, as a focal point to amplify that heart and conflict. Like we've already know, you know, we've seen a glimpse of John and Danny talking to each other with very serious looks on their faces down in the crypts. So we can expect that some of these really hard conversations are going to take place there. Yeah, I agree. So the, they seem to have made it um, the place where the Starks go to think about stuff. At the very least, this is this is the most Starkish place in in this universe. Uh, <laughs> Sansa goes down there to think about things. Uh, John clearly goes down there to brood. That's where Bran goes out and hides out early on. So this is this is like the the most Starkish bit of the world, and I think they will definitely keep that going. Um, and it's kind of played up. Uh, in that teaser trailer when you got um, uh, Arya and Sansa and Jon down there, it's very kind of Starkish walking. And they've clearly made a few more statues of Starks down for down there as well. So, so they, they're, they're playing this up. Linda Prosciutto, thank you so much. A uh, very generous super chat. Um, uh, do you think there's any possibility that Bran could end up ruling Westeros? Maybe not on the Iron Throne, though. Uh, well, I'll pick up on this one quickly, then throw to you, LML. Um, I think that the answer is no, in terms of I don't think he's going to rule as a as a real ruler, but where so he is in the show law at the moment, he is an ex Bran. That is what he is about at the moment. He he remembers being Bran. The, Bran's memories are part of him, but he's not got the character of Bran. What he is now is the three eyed Raven who is the collection of these memories, experiences, and personalities of all the other um, people who've taken on that role in the past. Now, that role seems to be very much this kind of idea that we had with Blood Raven as somebody, the power behind the throne, the person pulling the strings, seeing everything, trying to nudge uh, events from behind the scenes. So yes, perhaps managing things, but not actually, pardon me, not actually ruling. Do I think, therefore, that that's where he's going to end up? I don't think so. I think he's going to be very powerful in this uh, situation uh, and in this series, but I do not think that he's going to end up in that position of overall power at the end of it. That that would be too lopsided. This is about balance, and I don't think we're going to end up with uh, the, the trees winning and everyone else losing, as it were. But what do you think? I think that Bran is going into the trees for sure uh, at the end of all this. And we were talking earlier on on my pregame show, the Nawi show, about Bran's ice mark on his arm. When Night King touched him, he left an ice mark on his arm. And we don't know if that has the potential to spread, uh, but it doesn't seem to be going away. And so now he's in some way tethered. And he's you could even say that he's beginning to transform into an ice creature, like if that were to start spreading, then sooner or later you sort of carry it out to its logical conclusion. Um, and we've compared this to Frodo. So Frodo in Lord of the Rings, he gets uh, stabbed in the shoulder by one of the Nazgul on Weathertop. And that wound never goes away and it always hurts. And that plus carrying around the ring, which reeks of corruption and Sauron's evil magic, leaves him in a place where he can't even like keep living on, on Middle Earth and the elves essentially take him away to the Blessed Isles because it's the only way to sort of contain that level of toxic evil, essentially. And I'm summing up here, but, you know, we might see a similar thing with Bran, where he's been touched by the Night King. And even after all this is over, he can't just live a normal life. He might have to 
transcend all of this and become part of the weirwood net um and, and he and he might go out more spectacularly you know think of um when blood raven was stabbed by the night king he disintegrated into the ravens inside the dream world and you could see bran do some sort of great act that leads to his disintegration in sort of a puff of smoke if you will yeah, I think so. So w where we're looking at for Bran's fate is not ruling, it's not surviving. Bran, in a sense, Mira said it actually last season, he died in that cave. He, as a, as a person, he is now part of the Weirwood Network and we're just going to see him in one way or another be sucked up within it and his fate is whatever is the fate of the Weirwood Network. Um, Tanya, Yoga Nathan, thank you so much. Uh, I don't see a question attached to that super chat, but that was very generous. Uh, 21, I think that's Canadian dollars. Thank you so much for that. Uh, really do appreciate that. If I missed a question, could one of the moderators let me know? Um, we did have a couple of other super chats. Let me see if I can find one. Catherine Bassett, uh, thank you so much. Old Nan says the Night King is a Stark. Who would the dead Starks fight for? Yeah, so this is picking up on what we were talking about a moment ago. Um, the first, I think, so there's, I think there's two parts to this. The first part is whether old man is right and to be believed. And I think that we have to say the answer to that is sometimes, um, uh, she comes up with some other complete rubbish. <laughs> it has to be said, uh, we just focus on the things that make sense and she's right about. Um, but in terms of who the dead starts would fight for in the books, I think that, um, it's very clear that they are bound, in my view anyway, they are bound by magic to the crypts to be released magically in order to fight for the living Starks on the show. I think that they, if they are dead and released, certainly the more recently dead ones, any who fall in the battle of the Battle of Winterfell, they will be controlled by the Night King. So it's a difference between whether they are released to fulfill their vow or whether they are brought back in order to be under control of the Night King. Um, hey, Robert. Did, yeah. There's a call for let's dance. <laughs> because uh, out here in the serious moonlight, you have 1,000 viewers, buddy. Congratulations. Well, well, thank you so much, guys. Uh, I really do appreciate it. It's uh, This is a thing that we have been building up to for a long time and uh, you have no idea how blessed I feel by the community that has grown up uh, not just around this channel but the, the community is out there much more widely with uh, LML's channel and then out in the Song of Ice and Fire community guys so thank you I, I really appreciate it. I'm I'm as excited as you are by season eight so uh, so thank you uh, Maester Zen another six dollars sixty six they're, they're loving your number LML uh, the myth heads demand uh, this is what you're saying demand uh, you'll dance if we hit a thousand well i'm gonna save you spare you my dancing um <laughs> uh, so uh, uh but thank you i am as you probably cannot tell i'm dancing inside um uh tanya uh yoga nathan this is a follow-up i think uh with no question uh so you have got a question here saying still learning how to super chat probably well thank you that's very kind of you to uh, do it a second time thoughts about maybe the throne being destroyed I imagine some ironic, beautiful parallel from Valerian the Dread forging the throne to Drogon burning it down. Yes, yeah, so those who don't know, Valerian the Black Dread was the dragon ridden by Aegon the Conqueror, the first, uh, with his sisters, the first Targaryens who conquered Westeros. And the Iron Throne was forged from the swords of their vanquished foes in the fires of Balerion, his dragon. So, uh, so that's where it comes from. And so, yes, there clearly is a very strong um, symbolism imagery uh, when you get uh, Drogon, who is seems very, very similar to Balerion, same color uh, and uh, a lot of the same kind of characteristics. Um, it would make a lot of sense if Drogon would melt it down. But what do you think? Do you think that there's a chance that the Iron Throne will be destroyed? And if so, do you think Drogon's the, the I was going to say the man to do it, but uh, the, the dragon to do it? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's really more likely than not that the Iron Throne will cease to exist. I do like the idea of Drogon melting it down. I wouldn't get too like stuck on one way that it could happen. But yeah, that would be really good synergy since Balerion 
uh, forged it. And in the books, Drogon is even called the Black Dread Reborn. Uh, one of the one of the handmaidens or the other blood riders, I think it actually is, says to Danny, you know, well, there stands the Black Dread Reborn. So there's no question uh, that that would be really cool. And also, I think that, well, yeah, no, I'll just leave it at that. We've got a bunch of super chats, so I'll let you get through them. Uh, absolutely. So AU Pac-Mill, I think this builds on uh, this uh, and also uh, helpfully links back to something you were talking earlier about Frodo. Um, uh, thank you so much, AU, um, has, has been on this channel before, actually, AU, and is the nicest man on YouTube. So uh, do check him out. Um, saying, because 666 for each seems appropriate. Please know Lord of the Rings 2.0. Um, and Karen Nevers, just below that, I saw also commenting, Frodo falls to the ring in the end, so does Bran fall to the mental control of the Night King? I, I'm i going to use a different uh, Lord of the Rings analogy here that I'm not the first to do this, but uh, I think it's very clear, is that the One Ring is quite similar to the Iron Throne in that it is a symbol of power. It is something people are fighting over. And in the same way that in Lord of the Rings, that that had to be destroyed for the end of this that story. I think that the Iron Throne has to be destroyed in order for the end of this story, or otherwise it's just going to be the same. People are going to be fighting over it in the future again. So I think so, that has to be there. Robert, um, Dr. Meatball in the chat real quick says, uh, so we shouldn't waste all that iron swords to plowshares, baby. So he's saying <laughs> not only should we melt down the throne, but let's let's make some like some practical stuff, some horseshoes. I, that makes perfect sense. We should be definitely doing that. Um, uh, but in terms of AU Pack, you, your point saying, please no Lord of the Rings 2.0, I do not think this is going to be Lord of the Rings 2.0 either in the books or on the show, but George R. R. Martin is definitely going to create some allusions, A-L-L, allusions to uh, the, the Lord of the Rings in his works, and it will be interesting to see how they are picked up on the show. Where do you... LML, where do you see the, the kind of the links between the two? Do, where, where is it going to be strongest, do you think? Well, okay, so uh, the temptation of the ring is something that George is using more in the backstory. So Azor High is the one who was like tempted by the fire of the gods. He's more like Sauron, really. You know, he's, he's reaching for, or maybe even more goth if you want to go back. But I don't think there is a current character being seduced by power that's except for me i guess maybe like danny but it's not a magical thing it's just, it's just her like identifying her sense of home and her birthright with the iron throne and so she grows up as an orphan thinking that retaking the iron throne is what's going to like bring her home and stuff and she's going to turn away from the iron throne to sort of try to save the world or whatever but there's not really a direct analog to that um except for in the deeper mythology so i think that one of the cool lord of the ring parallels that i've talked about is this idea that John and Danny might end up going on a, a secret dragon mission to the north. And this is strongly hinted at in the previews because we see the two dragons flying in what really looks like, you know, far north of the wall. And then we also see a scene with the two dragons, Rhaegal and Drogon, sitting around in front of a bunch of charred bones. And John and Danny are walking up to them like a couple of pilots walking up to their F-14s or whatever. And John's on Rhaegal's side and Danny's on the Drogon side. It strongly hints that John and Danny are going on a secret dragon mission to the north. And so what I think is it's comparable to Frodo and Sam taking the ring to Mordor while everybody else fights the giant battle somewhere else. And so at some point, while the army of the dead marches south and all the forces of man are confronting them, it looks like John and Danny are going to be on their dragons flying to the north to do something. I don't know what they're going to do. Do they have to melt down the White Walker temple? Do they have to sacrifice themselves or Danny's baby? Hopefully not. That would be all twisted and stuff. Do they have to like melt down the weirwoods that Night King froze over? I don't know, but it seems like it's, it's a magical thing that they've got to go do there. Uh, I don't know that anybody's going to be home to fight them, but what do you think of all that stuff? I love that as a, as a concept. I, the, there is going to be a twist here that it, I hope uh, that it's not just a big battle and then the good guys win and the, the ice bad guys lose. Uh, there has to be something else that's going on. If, if that happens, I think it has to be teed up reasonably early on because we've had so few hints about how to end this threat of the White Walkers 
Bran has to be the one. I think he has to cast himself way up north just to see what's there. We've only had like a couple of fleeting glimpses of what might be up there and no hint that what is up there is in any way going to be the thing that um, could destroy them. The only hints we've had so far about what might be able to destroy them are the when Beric was pointing at the Night King and saying we have to kill him and then everyone else, like a domino effect, everyone else dies. And secondly, we've seen how they were created and therefore the idea that maybe somebody could reverse engineer this and take the dragon glass out of the Night King's heart or whatever. Those are the only two hints we've got so far. So if there is something up north, they have to tell us quite soon, I would suggest, or otherwise they're going up there not knowing what they're looking for. It's um, all going to end up with a freaky surgery scene. <laughs> I, if this ends up with surgery, I don't know what I will do. My head will explode, scalpel, I think. Scalpel. Four steps. <laughs> Stephen Stark, thank you so much. Uh, $10 saying a thousand cents for a thousand viewers. Stephen, thank you so much. You're a, a great servant of this community. I really appreciate that. Uh, Maura Lee, thank you. So, uh, again, another generous, Maura, thank you. Uh, another generous uh, super chat saying for all the mods, guys, yeah, if you're watching this live, can you give some love to the moderators? The moderators are the unsung heroes of this community. So thank you. Uh, Thomas Bingham saying a thousand congratulations, Robert and hi LML. Thank you so much. Um, Donald Peoples, gods, I love this fandom. Much love to you, Robert and LML, your fellow Song of Ice and Fire content creators, mods, and all you lovely chatters. Um, and then we've got Michelle Caden, $15, thank you so much. Can you see a crippled, bastard, broken thing triumvirate ruling Westeros after the throne is melted? Okay, so let's let's get on to that. This is sort of moving on to beyond episode one, but where are we going to end with this? What do you reckon, Elmel, in terms of who's ruling? Might we see that kind of, yeah. the, the cripples, bastards, and broken things for those who uh, haven't got the long memories? Uh, this was uh, something that... Tyrion said uh, way back in season one, and he said he has a special place in his heart for cripples, bastards, and broken things. He's talking to Bran at the time. Um, and the, the feeling has remained that that was quite an important quote because we've seen that the characters who seem to be surviving are not their outwardly powerful characters, but they are the ones who perhaps fall under those categories of being cripples, bastards, and broken things. But what do you think in terms of who might be running the whole show at the end? Well, I think the key is actually humility, not necessarily uh, having a big scar across your face or you know losing a hand or whatever. But if you're a character that, you know, I've often said that George hates the quarterbacks, the high school quarterback type, if you will, Robert, the the preening, the young Theon type, the super alpha cocky male. Like he, I don't think he was, he definitely was not that kind of dude in high school. And if you're not that kind of dude in high school, you usually don't really get along with those sort of dudes. And so every time you have a character like that in A Song of Ice and Fire, they get humbled and taken down and they're either killed or they're taken down to the point where they can learn gain humility, and then begin to rebuild themselves up as a character. And so you see that some of those ideas being toyed with, with Jamie and Theon uh, and other people, and even John. John's arc is a lot about deconstructing his own privilege and his sense of what's right and wrong and sort of learning. It's why Ygritte's always telling him, you know nothing. So I think the people that are going to survive to build the new world are the people who can, uh, who can learn if you will. Um, and a lot of times that is the crippled bastards and broken things, because if you're born a cripple or a bastard, then you're outside from the beginning and you already know humility. But if you're born, you know, with a lot of privilege, then it's necessary to be taken down. And so you might become a crippled or a broken thing. That's see the word broken implies the transformation. Like a bastard is born a bastard, a broken person suffers something that breaks them but then comes out stronger through the other side. George loves that stuff. He loves transformation and redemption and stuff. So I think that's the deeper meaning of the cripples, bastards, and broken things. And I do think that those are the people that will be around. Um, but I've got another super chat I picked up that I think we skipped over. Can I read it out? And uh, it's about yeah, lemon definitely. cakes. Okay, so Catherine Byerly says, Sansa loves lemon cakes and Danny dreams of the house with the lemon tree. What's the connection, if any, between them and Lemons and the two characters? Do you have an idea about this in terms of symbolism? Uh, well, I was going to throw that one. I saw that one as well. I was going to throw that one okay. straight to you because, guys, if you don't know, LML is our resident expert on symbolism and things like that. 
Uh, oh, sure. So yeah. this, this is one of the reasons why I have him on. I'm all about the characters and the plot. He's all about the symbolism and what these mean. So I'll sh throw that one straight back at you, if that's okay. So the house with the red door is a really important symbol for Danny because that represents home. And the lemon tree is in the house with the red door. Um, so there's, there's a lot of themes with sweetness and sweetness sort of being deceptive. Um, and you, you often see the lemon cake. So lemon cake is, is mixed in with sweetness. And I think that Danny chasing the house with the red door similarly is a little bit of a false dream. Like just, just like we were talking about, she's going to have to give up her dream of retaking the seven kingdoms and retaking the iron throne. That is a false attraction for her. And so George has this theme of sickly sweet that's running around all the time. So it's like the lure of something that seems sweet, but it's actually rotten. Um, it's, it's, so I think that's what's being touched on here because lemons are also sour too. So I don't know. I don't want to go too deep on it, but that's, that's the, that's my general take on it. Cause Sansa obviously can't sit around eating lemon cakes all day. Right. She's got to do a little better than that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think the only thing I would add to that is this is very much the lemon tree is very much a book thing. And that is connected for Danny with home of where she wants to be. Ultimately, this was the one safe place that she had as she was growing up, had a lemon tree growing up outside her window. With Sansa, lemons don't naturally grow up in Winterfell, but she loved lemon cakes. And for her, this was a kind of a lure down to King's Landing of where she wanted to be as she was growing up. So I think if anything, it's this kind of like opposite pulls. It's both about what they desire, but whereas with Danny, perhaps that's going to come true that that's actually what she wants, not the Iron Throne. With Sansa, I think it's going to turn out actually she doesn't want, she's been there already, she's gone to King's Landing, she doesn't want to be living that life. So I think if anything, there's a kind of like an opposite thing going on there. It's uh, okay if it K sorry, KFA says lemons and lemon cakes are symbols of home and childhood. So that's perfect. That, that, that makes sense. It's like when you're an adult, you can't go back to your childhood. Like clinging to your childhood is a certain way to kind of destroy your adult life. And Holly Drogon says Danny's memories are clouded with a child's perspective. She equates the red door with safety in a simpler time, but now she's painting Westeros red. And if she continues on her quest for the throne, she will paint Westeros red. So that's a very good thing. You have to move beyond the things of a child. Uh, in order to mature and grow as an adult. So this is cool. There's a lot of good sort of th themes that are running around here. But Sorry, Robert, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to make sure that we're, we're staying on top of it. Uh, I think that was really interesting, the, 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 the idea of the red as the juxtaposition as well. Uh, Guy Smulders, uh, thank you so much, saying, in the pilot, uh, Robert Baratheon arrives at Winterfell to ask Ned to go south. So this is way back in episode one of season one. Um, he arrives, asks Ned to go south, be his hand of the king. Do you think Danny will ask Sansa to go south to deal with Cersei after the battle? Um, personally, I think that they will play up a little bit of the, the imagery, uh, sort of echoing the imagery of episode one with Danny's arrival, and uh, we've already seen it in the, the trailers, you know, Winterfell is yours. It's the same language that was that Ned Stark used when Robert Baratheon arrived, and then um, we get uh, the same language that Sansa uses when Danny arrives. So yes, there's that kind of um, uh, echoing going on there. I don't think if Danny is around and alive, I cannot see that she is going to send uh, Sansa down to sort out Cersei. Danny is quite a hands-on leader. I think she's the kind of person who will say, well, I'll go down and sort this one out. Did you have any thoughts on that one? Uh, I'm interested in... So we we talked about the whole dynamic. Um, you know, a big theme of Game of Thrones is the people uh, squabbling over power while the White Walkers are coming, and there's a need to focus on the White Walkers, but nobody's doing that. It's a metaphor for all kinds of things, climate change or whatever. Um, so in this, we're going to see that theme played up basically in this in this season. At the beginning of the season, there will be all these tensions, and everybody's you know trying to protect their territory and their turf and all of that, but the army of the dead is going to force everyone to get along and forgive and move on. So expect the tension to be played up early on so that it's more meaningful when they put these things aside and work together at the end, essentially. Yeah, I couldn't agree more to that. This, this is going to be a two episode thing, the tensions. Uh, the moment that the army of the dead come onto the field, then that's going to be put onto the back burner. Uh, David Greening, thank you so much for the super chat. Didn't see a question there, but uh, if one of the moderators spots one, could you flag it up? 
Um, Michelle Kalen, just tying in with what we are talking about a moment ago, saying, I so hope that Danny and her child will find a house with a red door to peacefully live in uh, and love. In an ideal dream of spring, John would be with her any chance. Um, my short answer is no. I'm sorry. I don't think that there's going to be this happy family at the end of it with John and Danny and their baby growing up because that's just not how this is going to end. But we're, we're going to be going through sacrifices. They're going to be going through war. That If they both survive, I, do, I can't see Danny not wanting to uh, take the throne or neither of them are really just quiet, just sitting, sitting down and living in a corner somewhere, people. But LML, am I too much of a cynic? Is there a, is there a happy ending for them somewhere? Well, the closest that we could get is Danny and John's child maybe somehow being adopted by sam and gilly or something like that to raise happily so that we get a little bit of a little bit of something there but i don't even know if that'll happen so yeah absolutely okay we've got a couple of super chats i think i'm going to take uh together uh perhaps lml you could opine on these ones this is so andrew thompson says the stark man tied to a weirwood the night king uh, we don't have confirmation incidentally that he was a stock uh, but so the Night King tied to the Weirwood, do you think it's possible he feared for his life and wagged into the tree before the magic took hold? Perhaps the Night King wants to be complete. And then secondly, what do you think of the theory that the others weren't defeated in the battle? Uh, rather, the last hero brokered a diplomatic solution, uh, such as babies for peace, which humans have since reneged on. So the two questions, I'll throw them both at you, I think, uh, LML as a package about what the the beginnings were of, of all of this that, that sort of created the first long night well as i've said before i strongly suspect that um, what we're going to find out about the guy tied to that tree is that he was a stark and that not only that that he was a green seer and that that tree he was tied to was an important part of the magic and if there's an equivalent scene in the book or something similar then it's that stuff will be there even stronger more and more spelled out. And I think it's actually the other way around. Instead of Night King warging into the tree, what it was more like is the tree warging into Night King. Um, so he becomes sort of like an avatar of the Weirwoods, but a but a, an angry one. Uh, that's how I more how I see it. And then what was the second half of the question? Oh, the broker to diplomatic solution. Yeah. yeah, the only question about that, it seems thematically right, but I just wonder how you negotiate with people who speak with a tone of the cracking of ice. Like, how do you understand that what they want is like occasional baby sacrifice? I, it's really hard to say, um, but I do th I do think there could be some idea we haven't thought of, of, of how that works. Obviously, the others weren't totally defeated because they're back. So all they were done, all that all that happened is they were put, put, you know, put in their place or tamped down or maybe some magical barrier was created that held for a while and then eventually wore out or something. Hopefully we'll find out. Yeah, I, th I mean, I hope we find out too. This is my big hope for the season, and it would be my big disappointment if we don't find out a little bit more about what happened in that early time. Just in terms of those specifics, do I think that he wogged into the tree before the magic took hold? Personally, no, I do not think so. I think the reason why he's got his magical powers that he has is because he had those kind of green sea powers and they've just made an ice version of them. This is why... He seems to have like an ice version of what Bran has. There's so many synergies between the two of them. And in terms of um, the idea of whether they were defeated or whether there was a peace treaty, I think the only thing I would say is I agree completely. Clearly, they weren't defeated. Uh, absolutely. Um, I will just throw out something that uh, somebody came up with a theory. I Apologies, I've forgotten who it was. Um, uh, certainly the first time I saw it, on, I think on my live stream on Thursday, the idea that perhaps the, the babies that the ice walkers were gathering from Craster this time round, they weren't to be building up their army for now, but they were to take them back up to the north for the next time, if they have to come again next time, just to give them time to grow up. Uh, so I quite like that idea that perhaps they've been planning forward all this time as well. Oh, oh, that's awesome. So John and Danny are going up with their on their dragons to do an Anakin all the Skywalker baby. and basically kill all a bunch of babies in the White Walker Temple. That's awesome. Ab that's absolutely. So it's uh, it's it's an idea. It's uh, it, it kind dark, of works. Dude. It is. It's very dark. So let's not concentrate on it too much. Uh, but yeah, it's a possibility. 
So uh, can I actually let me let me give you something? Um, uh, I you know me, I always like to pull a, a a a book quote or two, and we were just talking about what John and Danny might be doing um, yeah. in that in that secret mission. So at the House of the Undying in the books foreshadows this really, really, really well. And it starts in a clash of kings. Um, I've got this queued up. Do you want to grab a couple of these and then I'll get this? Or do you want me to go ahead and get it now? Uh, if you've got it all queued up, do it now. Uh, my Kindle's going slow. Okay. Well, then in that case, let's just quickly talk about um, Bis Biscavity. I hope I pronounced that right. Saying finally catching live... Uh, yeah, by the way, I should just say, if you're new, if this is your first time, welcome. It's great to see you. Uh, I'm doing these on Sunday at this time every week during the season, as well as my normal live streams, which are going to be on Thursdays. I do them every week on Thursdays at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, but it's fantastic to see all the new people in the chat today um, saying thanks for your work. Love following you both. No question about the story. Just curious how excited you are about the amazing masterpiece of music we'll get from Ramin jo Jawadi. Uh, cheers from Finland. Yeah, I would just say that I, I'm i not alone in this, but I, I consider him to be one of the MVPs of the entire thing. The, the score has been astonishing. Uh, and you know, this yeah. channel, I, I covered Westworld season two as well. The work he's done for that has been astonishing. Well, he's an incredibly talented guy, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what he's got coming up for this uh, this season. The finale is going to be, uh, I'm, I'm expecting to be blown away. Uh, LML, do you have any, uh, have those things that you were looking for? I do. And just to, just to follow up, um, I do, I certainly hope that we do not get White Walker infanticide. Um, <laughs> just to be clear, I, <laughs> you seem very I, when excited I said, by the idea. Well, yeah, I know. When I said great, that was like, uh, oh boy, great. Like, yeah, that would be horrible. Um, so, hopefully, that doesn't happen. I don't think it will either because I don't think there is a White Walker daycare and a White Walker junior high school and a White Walker prom. And I don't think so. I think there's in the books, I think they're taking the babies and doing more of a magical harvesting of their life force to create an ice golem or something. In the in the book reality, I'm imagining that baby probably grows up really fast um, after they do their magic ceremony. But yes, I do have this quote. So this is Danny at the House of the Undying, which I think is a very heavy foreshadowing for what Danny and Drogon are going to need to do north of the wall. And the Undying are described very much like the others. And so they're in this shadowy room, and and their descriptions is. Um, they're basically like they're cold shadows and they're sitting around this table and says a long stone table filled the room above it floated a human heart swollen and blue with corruption yet still alive it beat a deep ponderous throb of sound and each pulse sent out a wash of indigo light the figures around the table were no more than blue shadows as danny walked to the empty chair at the foot of the table they did not stir nor speak nor turn to face her so Right there, you can. This is a strong parallel to the others, right? They're blue shadows. There's a blue heart. So I'm thinking about this blue heart as the heart of winter. And they go on and talk to her and they send her some visions. Um, but the important thing that comes is when uh, Drogon gets into the action. So it says, through the indigo murk, she could make out the wizened features of the undying one to her right, an old, old man, wrinkled and hairless. His flesh was a ripe violet blue, his lips and nails bluer still, so dark they were almost black. Even the whites of his eyes were blue. They stared unseeingly at the ancient woman on the opposite side of the table, whose gown of pale silk had rotted on her body. One withered breast was left bare in the Carthine manner to show a pointed blue nipple hard as leather. She's not breathing. Danny listened to the silence. And then they're talking to her and they're whispering to her, telling her to drink from the cup of ice and fire. And then all of a sudden, it says, uh, the phantom shivered through the murk, images and indigo. Um, and then faster and faster the visions came one after another until it seemed the very air had come alive. And then finally, uh, they, she wakes up from the visions and it says they were reaching for her, touching her, tugging at her cloak, the hem of her skirt, her foot, her leg, her breast. They wanted her, needed her, the fire, the life. Danny grasped, gasped and opened her arms to give herself to them. But then black wings buffeted her round, round her head and a scream of fury cut the indigo air and suddenly the visions were gone, ripped away and Danny's gasp turned to horror. 
The undying were all around her, blue and cold, whispering as they reached for her, pulling, stroking, tugging at her clothes with their cold, dry hands, twining their fingers through her hair. All the strength had left her limbs. She could not move. Even her heart had ceased to beat. She felt a hand on her bare breast, twisting her nipple. Teeth found the soft skin of her throat. A mouth descended on one eye, licking, sucking, biting. Then indigo turned to orange and whispers turned to screams. Her heart was pounding, racing. The hands and mouths were gone. Heat washed over her skin and Danny blinked at the sudden glare. Perched above her, the dragon spread his wings and tore at the terrible dark heart, ripping the rotten flesh to ribbons. And when his head snapped forward, fire flew from his open jaws, bright and hot. She could hear the shrieks of the undying as they burned, their thin, high, papery voices crying out in tongues long dead. Their flesh was crumbling parchment, their bones dry, wood soaked in tallow. They danced as the flames consumed them. There's, they staggered and writhed and spun and raised blazing hands on high, their fingers bright as torches. <clears throat> so there's a lot going on there, but you can see that the others, the undying who are stand-ins for the others, they want to claim Danny. They want to claim her fire, her dragons, her life, her power. But then she burns them with the dragon. And so you can you can literally see the heart of winter being roasted by dragon fire or or something like that. What do you think, Robert? I like the idea. I think so. Context for show only people. The in season two when Danny goes to the house of the undying with those those freaky guys and she gets the vision of her like walking through the red keep and there's snow coming down and all the rest of it. That is a lot more detailed in the books and we get the the things that uh, LML was reading out just there. Now there's a lot of truth in what she sees there. It's very clear that there's that there's this season. These aren't just like random made up images. There's a lot of truth that was going on there. I I haven't yet, well, I'm not 100% convinced that that's a, a pure analogy across to going up to say the heart of winter. I can see it, but that requires the, what's happening with the house of the undying to be uh, the same as effectively the army of the dead. Um, and I'm not 100% uh, up with that and I'm... Maybe, maybe. So I like the thinking, but I'm not 100% sure I'm there. What I do like is this idea that you mentioned earlier is that they Dan Danny and John may go beyond the wall to try and find some stuff out. What they do there, I do not know yet. But if, if there is something that they have to destroy that will destroy the White Walkers, we have to be told about it, or otherwise there's no reason for them to be going up. They... Uh, they They've, we've been given no hint that they think that the answer is way up north somewhere. We've not even been really told about the heart of winter. Um, well, well, so we've seen uh, the White Walker Temple where they transform the babies, but we've also seen Blood Raven's tree get frozen. And we know that, that um, we've, we've seen that tree with the obelisks all around it where the Night King was transformed. So that's, that is the place that has the most sort of resonance and importance that is basically, I would say, the heart of winter. Yeah, so so I think I agree. And I think I want to move back to the, uh, the questions uh, from the chat in just a second. I agree that if there's an answer, it seems to be from there. I do not know the extent to which this was deliberate or not, but they clearly showed in the background of that that there was the same mountain that shaped like a, an arrowhead that was in the background for the big battle Exactly. At the, at the end of season um, seven uh, with the, the Night King, which was clearly a day or so's day march north of the, the wall. So it wasn't the heart of winter. This was something that sort of closer to home. So it's possible, I agree, that if they go and destroy that, but I don't think that's necessarily the same place. Uh, certainly the answer for the the... the the army of the dead, how to end it has to be something to do with their creation. That much I agree. And therefore that ge geographical place could well be crucial. Um, this uh, probably ties in with a couple of things we've got. So Jean-Luc Picard asks, every season has had a big flashback. Uh, if you had to guess just one for this season, what would it be? Uh, do you think, that, so, so I'll throw that one to you. Do you think that we're going to get some sort of flashback that tells us something about this and connected to that 
and what we were talking about just a moment ago. Uh, Nadim Atalia, or Atala says, Hey, Robert LML, long time listener to both channels, watching First Time Live. Welcome. Uh, will we see the Isle of Faces this season and what will happen there? So, w where would you pick? Do you think we're going to get the Isle of Faces and do you think that we're going to see something in a flashback this season? So, yeah, the flashbacks are going to be very important this season. Uh, I don't think we'll get one in the first episode because um, in the first episode, we're going to be dealing with the information that we learned in the last flashback, which has to do with Tower of Joy and RLJ. So we're going to be dealing with those events for an episode or two. Um, but the in, the White Walker threat coming on is going to force Bran with the aid of Sam, I think, to sort of go searching in the Weirwood memory banks to find information about dealing with the White Walkers. And obviously Bran's already on to that idea. So we will get flashbacks, probably not in the first episode. And as far as Isle of Faces, it's kind of similar to the Heart of Winter. It's like, it's not that that weirwood tree where Night King was created is the Heart of Winter. It's more like the Heart of Winter and the Isle of Faces are book concepts that have to do with the idea of like the hub of the weirwood net, hub of the White Walkers. And so those ideas will be represented in the show. I don't know if they'll call it the Isle of Faces or the Heart of yeah. Winter, but we have the frozen weirwood tree with the obelisks. You know, we might see in a flashback something that looks like the the verdant version of that, a green forest where the children are that we can think of as the Isle of Faces. But um, we, we are going to get some amount of information because we know that the future echoes the past. And we know that the secrets to dealing with the Night King and the Army of the Dead lie in the past. Yeah, I think you brought this around to something I can definitely agree with, which is that the concepts in the books, like the Isle of Faces, very important in the books. Um, this was where the pact between the humans and the children of the forest was signed. This seems to be the sort of the hub of the Weirwood Network. That's not really been mentioned so much on the show, um, but I think the concept of that and the concept of the heart of winter, which is where the, night, the, the White Walkers seem to be coming from, hasn't really been on the show so much. There was, as you say, there was that one uh, little bit when we were shown something up north. Uh, but if they are going to do a shortcut, then they're going to have the feel of those, and the shortcut seems to be that swirly thing, and it does certainly make sense to me where that something is going to happen there connected to the end of the White Walkers in the same way that it was the beginning of the White Walkers. Perhaps it's destroying it, who knows. Um, Kiddo B, thank you so much. Um, saying uh, continued from LML's channel. Yes, for those who have just uh, joined us, uh, LML did a live stream just before this one. I had popped onto that one for a little while, and then he's uh, graciously come over here as well, um, saying we mentioned there about the possibility of Jon Snow becoming cold hands as a form of atonement. Uh, wasn't his joining the Night's Watch a kind of sacrifice? Uh, thanks, love your videos, Robert. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, yeah, so... Cold Hands for show people is a character who's in the books. He's kind of got rolled up into the character of Benjen. So he's this sort of like uh, undead or sort of white kind of character who seems to be working with Blood Raven and has been there for a while. And we were speculating on the idea that perhaps that might have been the original Azora High way back in the day, who's as some sort of penance been wandering around uh, trying to say sort of be the first layer of defense against the white walkers return um the question here is whether or not john joining the night's watch is a kind of sacrifice well yes it is but i think that the the, the point here is that john did not realize the sacrifice that it was benjamin says to him you do not know what you are giving up benjamin uh, i think many others think benjamin knew knows who John is, and therefore what he's actually thinking, you're actually giving up the throne. So yes, it was a sacrifice, but it wasn't what he thought he was sacrificing. But did you want to just sort of play off of that a little bit because of yeah, that because, conversation we're having? So I think that um, one of my best known theories is called the Green Zombies Theory. And the theory is that, you know, we hear the story of the last hero had 12 companions and he journeyed into the cold lands and one by one his companions died. And then he fro his sword froze and broke and he was the others were chasing him. And then the children of the forest helped him somehow. And he returns to lead the Night's Watch into battle, defeat the others with a sword made of dragon steel. That's the last hero myth in a nutshell. And so my theory is that 
Those 12 companions died and were resurrected. Just like John is resurrected, just like Benjen was resurrected in the show, just like Cold Hands in the books used to be a ranger. We've got this running idea of zombie Night's Watch rangers. And I think that it makes a lot of sense because just like we saw with Benjen and uh, Cold Hands Benjen and actual Cold Hands, zombies are perfect for the North. They don't need fire. They don't need to eat. They don't need to sleep. So all the things that make the frozen lands really deadly for humans don't apply to zombies. And so we see Cold Hands Benjen or Cold Hands in the book, just ranging the forest, waiting to help people. And so essentially what I'm saying, Robert, is that joining the Night's Watch originally might have meant becoming a zombie, like a Cold Hands. And so now what we have with the, joining the Night's Watch, it's like a smaller version of that. You're not actually being killed and resurrected, but you are giving up your chance to father sons and, and or daughters. So you're not going to have any family or, or line. You're giving up your whole life, essentially. You're putting on black, the color of mourning. You're living at the end of the world. You can't leave the wall. And so Cold Hands is just one step further. He's on the other side of the wall, but he can't have children or much of a life. He's given his whole life to the watch. So John becoming the new Cold Hands, which is one thing that I think could happen, would essentially just be a further a furthering of the idea of him joining the watch and giving up all of his life, giving up his desires to serve the realm. Yeah. And, and one thing I really like about this idea is the fact that John, um, he's never sought power and he might be on the show. He is the rightful King, but I don't think he will want that. He's never saw all the positions of power he's got when he was made uh, Lord Commander of the Night's Watch, when he was making the North, he didn't seek that. Other people just sort of like said, here, you take it on. Um, people, again, will want him to become the king, but I think that he doesn't want that. And I think the idea of him uh, spending eternity or the rest of his life or whatever, just humbly serving in some kind of self-sacrifice, that kind of appeals to me as a sort of an ending for him. It has to, has to be said. Um, uh, just quickly getting back to the super chats, uh, real chunker. Thank you so much. Uh, saying thoughts on the theory that Tommen is actually the Valonqar and Cersei will kill her, kill herself once she comes to terms with the reality that she is responsible for his death. See Bridge Falls, Cersei's death. So Bridge Falls, another content creator. I haven't watched that video. I have to say so. I can't comment on that one specifically. Uh, but the idea that uh, Tommen is the Valonqar, and the Valonqar is a. Uh, uh, this is from if you remember, Maggie the Frog gave Cersei those uh, the prophecies. Um, I, they showed it at a flashback at the beginning of one of the seasons, season five, I think. Um, and the bit that they missed out at the end of that was the idea of the Valonqar, who is this character who's who, uh, and it, that's a translation from High Valyrian is is little brother, as we were told that it means little brother, um, and that is the person who's going to kill Cersei. And so there's a lot of speculation out there about who this person might be. She clearly thinks in the books that it's Tyrion, which is what drives a lot of her anger and hatred of him. But at the same time, a lot of people think it might be other characters. Tommen is clearly the little brother out of her children. And I've certainly heard the, the, the theory that there's a possibility that Tommen could be brought back by Kyburn, turning him into one of his kind of like science whites, like he has the mountain there. He's the, uh, he could bring him back because Kyburn took the body. This much we know he got told that you can you can have Tommen's body um so that certainly makes kind of sense will Cersei kill herself personally I don't think she will I don't think that's where she's I think she's going she will have to be killed by somebody stopping her doing something horrendous I think that there's a good chance that we could get uh, some sort of reenactment of the, the Jamie's backstory of the Mad King about to blow up King's Landing having to be stopped and her being the mad queen i think we've had quite a lot of things teeing that up but what what do you think in terms of cersei where do you do you who do you think is going to be killing her at the end of it well she's definitely way past feeling bad about tom and i mean that that bridge is crossed um so uh you know i i think it really should be jamie i think it will be jamie in the books the jamie cersei thing is kind of different in the show 
So I'm not sure if that'll happen. Um, we we speculated. Here's I don't know who killer, but here's a great tinfoil that we came up with on the uh, on the Mythhead show on the Nawi show on my Lucifer means Lightbringer channel. We came up with the idea that what if Cersei is killed and right next to her is Kyburn, who's been practicing raising the dead for a while now and who whose entire future and fate is tied up into Cersei being queen. What if Kyburn resurrects Cersei and you get sort of like a Cersei Stoneheart type of figure? That might be an interesting way to level up Cersei's character, um, to have her be actually an undead Knight's Queen, Corpse Queen type of type of being. What do you think of that? Well, yeah. I mean, it's tinfoil, but I mean, it's just an it idea. Is, it is. It's tinfoil I mean, there is something in the books, one of the pre-released chapters from the Winds of Winter, Euron's uh, playing around with visions and Victarion has a vision uh, about um, uh, the, uh, him on the Iron Throne. And then there's a sort of, I can't remember the exact wording. Uh, you may have it at your fingertips, but there's, there's sort of the corpse bride with him effectively. So there is some kind of imagery that we have got going along with that. I agree with you in terms of the books. Jamie's character arc seems to be taking him back to uh, to Cersei uh, at, for some kind of final confrontation. So I think that works really well there. The idea that Kyburn might bring her back, it would really only be for like an episode or two with my view. I she's safe for the first three episodes, certainly of these. Uh, the focus is going to be up on the north. It's only when people start coming down south that we, she's going to start really getting in any kind of danger. So it's only it would only be for the last episode or two. My, um, we were brainstorming on like ways that the whole magical others plot might collide with Cersei and Euron. We talked about Cersei becoming a Knights Queen figure. We talked about what if Knights King is slain, but his spirit is, goes and inhabits somebody else. Like, what if it seizes Euron's body and we get a Euron Knight's King figure that sort of starts to parallel the books a little bit more? That would be crazy, too. It absolutely would. And one thing I am personally convinced of is that what we're going to see is Kyburn creating more of his undead, more of his science whites. The mountain was just the prototype. There are definitely going to be more. We had... Uh, last season, if you remember in the Dragon Pit, he picked up the hand of one of the whites and looked at it curiously. I think that's a hint that he's going to be making more of these kind of things. Uh, he's clearly fascinated with it. So we're going to be seeing uh, what happens around King's Landing is not suddenly going to be just like, here's just another bunch of humans. This is going to be a very complicated system with some uh, whites there as well, not just humans. So, yeah, the idea that perhaps that there will be... Um, um, either Cersei or Euron could themselves be turned into whites. I, I like that. I think that would look really cool. Um, I think definitely they will be controlling an army of whites, which places them in this, I, this place of being the Night King and Night's Queen because they have their own army of the dead. So I yeah, think at least in parallel, right? Exactly. Certainly symbolically and in parallel, that will be happening. Whether they themselves do or not, I don't know. I personally just think uh, my uh, my dark horse for surviving is Kyburn. I think that there's a good <laughs> chance that one of one of the people we consider to be a bad guy will survive because this isn't just going to be good guys surviving. And he's, I think, is one of the the person most likely out of that lot to. It'll be Sam it and Kyburn playing Savas, talking about how to cure grayscale at the end or something. <laughs> it, it, there could be worse endings. It has to be said. Um, Let's go. So, Kathy Stark, thank you so much. Saying hi, Robert and LML, best pre-game show on the interwebs. Thank you so much. Uh, and are those some horny goats? Uh, I think they might well be. Thank you. Um, uh, spicy. Uh, do you think Howland Reed will finally turn up? Sorry if this was asked already. I only just tuned in. Uh, it hasn't been asked. I think we covered it over on LML's channel, but uh, very happy to talk about it. Howland Reed is one of my favourite characters. Always happy to talk about Howland Reed. In the books is a very different thing. On the show, I suspect not in a major role. That's that's what I'm saying. I think that he's going to be the equivalent of uh, when on the show, you remember, they lingered 
on Dawn, the sword, Arthur Dane's sword, just for a few seconds, as if to sort of get a little nod to the fandom to say, we know that in the books this is really big and important. We're not making a big deal of it, but it's there. They did the same thing with the Horn of Winter. They lingered on it for a bit. They, so that we knew that they knew, and then they moved on. They're not going to make a big thing of it. I think that it's going to be the same with Helen Reed, because a lot of his role in the books is going to be revealing the backstory about what has happened at the Tower of Joy and things like that. They've given that role to Bran and Sam. So the purpose of him being there is slightly um, uh, undermined by what they've been doing. And that's, it's okay. I find it disappointing, but it's okay. Might, so, might, might he be given a cameo? Yeah, absolutely. But I don't think he's going to be a major player in season eight. What, what so do you what, think? Well, what he could bring to the table would be insight on Ned's thinking and feelings that might not be apparent from the visions. Um, and the other reason to do it would be because Ma Mira had such a shitty exit last season uh, with the, that really rough departure from Bran, where Bran, you know, basically didn't give a crap about, you know, Mira saving his life and doing all that work and Jojen dying and all that. So it'd be really nice to see Mira again and get some other beat, some other note, uh, you know, from her story, because she was such a great character. And so if you get Howland and Mira making a little appearance, that would still be a nice bit of fan service. I, I do hope we get that. Yeah, then I, I, I agree. So, and just, just just interrupt at that point, I think that they did tee it up a little bit twice last season. Mira mentioned when she was getting trying to get through the wall, she said, I am Mira Reed, daughter of Howland Reed. And then she did say she was going to go back to be with her family. So they have teed it up if they're going to bring him in. And then I was going to ask you about um, Aziz from History of Westeros' theory that uh, the others are essentially going to be defeated in the first part of the season and that it's actually Cersei that will be set up as the final boss. What do you think of that idea? I, I tend to disagree. I think it's interesting. I don't think it'll happen, but what do you think? Um, well, they can go one of two ways with this. Uh, the, the, the way that they is definitely, in my view, the way that they're definitely doing it, or George R. R. Martin is definitely doing it in the books, is that we're going to have, he talks about the scouring of the Shire which is the penultimate chapter of the Lord of the Rings, which is all about the aftermath, after the huge battle, after the ring's gone, Sauron's gone, going back and dealing with Baddy, no, Baddy B, um, which is not, not the main thing, but they have to tidy it all, all up afterwards. And, and George R. R. Martin has said that he wants the ending of A Song of Ice and Fire to have the same feel of that. So in the books... Yeah, I think that whatever's happening with the others is going to be dealt with. And then at the end, we've got this, oh, but actually we've got this other thing we also need to deal with back home. Let's go and sort hmm. that out. So that seems to be where that's going. Uh, okay. in, ter in terms that of the show, then I think that leaves us with two ways, one of which is I think is slightly more ambitious than the other. The, the, the first is, yes, the way that Aziz says, I did a video about the Night King where I kind of played that out um, as how that might work with this idea of what they've given us so far about the killing off the Night King. I had this idea that Melisandre might come back with fiery swords and all the rest of it, and that might be the dramatic end to it. And then we get the, as I've been explaining, the scouring the Shire, the kicking Cersei out of King's Landing bit, the second half. I like that. I like that comparison a lot. And by the way, what Melisandre is going to come back with is the High Priest of Valor, who's going to have the Valerian Steel Thanos gauntlet, uh, which you use to <laughs> punch White Walkers, and uh, that's it. It's going to be very effective. Well, she's going to come back, and her story ends, her character arc ends with the end of the Night King, because that's what she's all about. Um, so the more complicated thing would be they lose, the, the, the good guys lose the Battle of Winterfell, and they're heading down south, um, and uh, being chased by the army of the dead. But I think uh, that that is a lot more complicated and I can't, I, if, at the moment, and I might change my mind after episode one, at the moment I'm tending towards uh, uh, what you called Aziz's idea, uh, that this is, this is there. There seem to be two halves to this season. Almost all of the footage, if not all of the footage they've given us is from episodes one to three. I've got a reasonably clear idea what's going to happen in episodes one to three. Not exactly, but roughly. 
episodes four to six is anyone's game. I'm really excited by it, episodes four well, to Well, that's six. a great comparison, and that puts it in better context for me. Like, looking at the Cersei cleanup at the end kind of as, like, the scouring of the Shire, that, that makes a lot of sense. So, cool. I'm glad I brought that up then. And props <laughs> to Aziz and History of Westeros. And absolutely, another fantastic creator who's been on here a few times before. Um, a few quick super chats to go through. Poisoned uh, Pinup saying thanks for all your vids and streams. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Uh, Licardo Guira saying who has a better claim to the throne, John or Gendry? I'll just quickly answer this one. So, in terms of the way that the show have set it up, it is very clearly John. They have set it up so that he is the rightful king. Gendry is a bastard child of Robert Baratheon. He was not legitimized, therefore he has no claim to the throne. The reality is that certainly in the books, but um, definitely on the show as well, is that the the idea of a rightful king is, is pretty much meaningless. It's whoever has got the power to claim the throne. So I think that the idea that uh, one person is more rightful than the other Fire and Blood, the history of the Targaryens that George R. R. Martin released, shows time and time again it's not who is the legitimate heir who inherits the throne, it's whoever has got the power to claim the throne. So I think that is the, the way that we need to be looking at this rather than who theoretically is, is next in line to it. But in terms of the show, they will play up very much the idea that this is John because, and they will play up not so much the should it actually be. Um, um, Gendry, but they will be playing it up against the the Danny thing, uh, and the how will she react to the idea that actually this thing that she's been fighting for all this time it's not rightfully hers. Um, Linda, yeah, can, sorry, okay, go go ahead. Ahead. I just, I'm just going to quickly agree. You can see where this is going. The whole point of making John the heir and Danny the heir is so that they can fight about it, and then both make the selfless decision and give up their claims and fight the White Walkers instead. Uh, or maybe melt down the Iron Throne. So, I mean, you, thematically, you can see where it's going. I just hope they do a really good job of making it carry the necessary weight so that you really feel everything that they're giving up and the sacrifice means something. But uh, carry on. I, I was going to get to Linda Pasuta for another incredibly generous super chat, Linda. Thank you so much. I really do appreciate uh, your support for the channel. Do you think they'll have to destroy both the Night King's Ice Temple or source of ice power? and the singer's either faces to destroy the imbalance. Um, this is an excellent question. I will definitely throw this to you in just a second, Alamal. When I talk about balance, which I do quite a lot on, on my live streams and in my videos, what I'm normally talking about is ice and fire as the balance. Because the way this is set up, uh, George O. Martin sort of borrowed a bit from Robert Frost's poem, I, uh, Fire and Ice, about two opposing forces fire and ice, both of which could destroy the world. And the clear point of that is that it doesn't matter which one does it. Uh, what actually matters is making sure neither do. And what we've got here in the Song of Ice and Fire is these two opposing forces as has been set up, ice and fire. And they are symbolically, there are many layers to this, but symbolically we've got the ice king being ice, We've got Danny and her dragons being fire. John in the middle is symbolically half ice and half fire. And so that is where we get this kind of balance. Now, when I say that the end of this has to have some sort of balance, it's about making sure that the White Walkers don't just win, the dragons don't just win, they have to be both pushed back in some way because they could both destroy the world. And so that is where I think that we're going to end up. Tying this into your question then, do we need to destroy both the, the source of the Night King's power and the Isle of Faces? I wonder, building on what we we're talking about earlier, whether in the show they're going to conflate the two, because the others in the books, the, the imagery, and this is, I'm, LML will be able to wax lyrical on this, but the imagery from the others is very, very closely aligned with the imagery of the children of the forest. Whenever, the, when they come in, in the prologue, it's very much that it's about out of the woods um, and all the rest of it. And this is the, the language which is there, which ties in with what the show has shown us about them being, the, the White Walkers being created by the children of the forest. So uh, if anything, they're more over there, that that is a more natural center ground, if it were, as it were, than just being 
the opposite of the ice, if that makes sense. There's there's a connection there. But LML, you will be able to say this a lot more eloquently than I can. What what do you make of this? Well, well, well. False modesty, false modesty. But nobody sounds more eloquent. See, you your British oh, accent God. gives you eloquent eloquency points, like just right off the bat. Think, so. <laughs> it's a, an accident of <clears throat> birth does not does not eloquence make. However, flattery uh, will get you everywhere. And I would say that you're totally right about the White Walkers being like icy versions of the children of the forest or icy cousins to them or something like that. Um, I do think so. I do think the Weirwoods might need to go away as well. Um, the Weirwoods are kind of, I mean, they're kind of creepy to put it mildly, but they look to be literally in pain or in anger, when you look at the faces and the way they're described, the faces in the heart trees, they're never happy. Um, and so they basically look like a bleeding and burning tree person that's like not very excited to be around. And if you think about it, <clears throat> the, the idea that they're called white trees, like W-H-I-T-E, -T -E, might be a play on words, as in W-I-G-H-T, white trees, because not only are they tied to the others and the whites, but the weirwoods themselves are kind of like a zombie they're hollowed out and they've got other intelligences living inside them and controlling them who are the green seers. So in my opinion, the green seers need to get out of the weirwoods and the weirwood net might need to be destroyed. And in the show, apparently it seems like the children of the forest are all gone too. So it's like the children of the forest are mo sort of passing out of the world. The weirwoods might pass out with them. That's essentially, I think it's a very realistic possibility. Yeah, I, I I would tend to agree. I think that the the children of the forest on the show. I think we've seen the last of them. Uh, the the Weirwood Network itself, I think, probably will also go, and that means Bran also going. Whether he does this in some kind of self sacrificial way, I like the idea. Um, but yeah, I I certainly see the White Walkers being pushed back. The fire being pushed back, which means I don't see the dragons surviving, and I see the Weirwood Network itself um, dying in some way. Which kind of leads to, the, does this mean all magic's gone? I don't think necessarily that's going to be the case, but I think that the things which could destroy the world will be pushed back. It wouldn't leave it past the showrunners to go to like a, a little shot at the end of like, oh, there's some more dragon eggs over here, or oh, there's some more White Walker babies over here, so that we get the idea that this whole thing might happen again at some point in the future. But for the foreseeable future, at the end, it's going to be things that could destroy the world having been pushed back. Robert, it's going to end with some cold mists that are swirling around and in interesting patterns that people will be breaking down on YouTube forever, trying to figure out if it's a Stark sigil or an ice dragon, or that'll be the la <laughs> literally the last shot of the series. I, I just desperately want the whole thing just to fade to black, uh, just to, just in a kind of Sopranos way, and everyone goes, wait, wait what? What just happened? I, that, I would love it, uh, but... Uh, meteor. Yeah, I, It'll be a meteor. You see, you see the streak through the sky, and then... <laughs> Moon meteors, that's all it's going to be. Um, let's go with Squid Burritos 42. Uh, what do you, is that like crock and tacos? I'm not entirely sure. What do you think about the conversation? Yes, it is. <laughs> Absolutely. It's, it's, a, that's what you find at the same sort of taqueria as a crack and taco. You find a, what is a squid burrito? Yeah. Excellent. Mm. Well, taquerias is a thing that I've never been to a taqueria. I didn't even know it was a concept, I have to say. Uh, but what do you think about the con conversation between John and Eamon? Is it foreshadowing John's heart in conflicts to choose between honor and those he loves? This is a hark back to, I think it was in season one, when you remember Maester Eamon, who is, uh, he's a Targaryen, uh, but he was a maester at the wall, and John, and they have quite a few conversations, and Eamon says uh, kind of wise words about uh, love being the, the death of honour and honour being the love of death. Um, there clearly was a short-term payoff for that, which was the issue about whether or not John would um, prioritise his family over his honour, as it were, in terms of whether he's going to abandon the Night's Watch to go and try and uh, avenge his uh, presumed father, Ned Stark, 
uh, or whether he was going to stay at the Night's Watch and do what he'd sworn to do, which was abandon all ties to the past. So there clearly was this original little bit of payoff going on there. The question is whether or not this is foreshadowing John's heart in conflict um, at the end. I don't think necessarily, but this is a theme which runs uh, all the way through John's um, kind of uh, character, that the idea that he does what he thinks is the right thing, uh, and he seems to do it with quite a heavy heart. This sometimes make him, makes him seem very earnest as a character, it has to be said. And he's always making these sort of conflicted choices between love and honour. There was Igreet. We remember uh, that what was he? He loved her, but his promise was to the and, and his honor was to the Night's Watch. So, what was his choice going to be there? That was played out for a long time. Um, uh, similarly, we've had things about uh, the, the when he left the Night's Watch about the abandoning of, of his duty there and reclaiming Winterfell for the Starks. Uh, and Sansa had to G him up to do that that time. So this has been something which has been playing all the way through John's character, all the way through the series. The question is, is it going to be the key question for him in terms of his ending? What do you think on that one, LML? I think cuttlefish quesadillas. <laughs> <laughs> Cuttlefish and it's very uh, helpful as always. Uh, I mean, uh, I'm yes. sorry. Can you please repeat the question, Robert? I, my my brain was wiped out by a KFA 303 on that 4303 on that one. <laughs> well, okay. So this is about the conversations between John and Maester Eamon with the uh, heart it being in conflict, choosing between honor and love and things like that. I was saying this has clearly been a theme throughout his life deciding whether yes. to go and fight for Ned, etc. Is this going to be a theme for his end in some way? So, yeah, he's he's constantly had to do things that are considered possibly dishonorable, or you'd say he's sacrificing his own reputation in order to save people. And this is the lesson that Corrin Halfhand really taught him. And we saw Ned do that, too, at the very end. In order to try to save Sansa's life, He he said that he did try to you know, he pleaded guilty to crimes he didn't commit, essentially, to try to save people. So he sacrificed his own honor and let everyone think he was a traitor in order to try to save people. Um, and John's had to do similar things. So how could that, I, there's no question that's a theme. The question is, how could that come out? How could that work out for John? In what way could he sacrifice his honor one more time? Yeah. God, I mean, that would, I or don't know. It's almost like he'd have. Is the, is the, that's the flip side of it. Yep, he does that as well. He does that as well. I mean, anything where he becomes a new cold hands or something, he's sacrificing basically everything related to love and passion. And it could be that people come away thinking that he was like a white walker somehow, or that he was an evil guy. And maybe to in order to like neutralize the white walkers, he's got to transform more icy or something and people will get the wrong idea. And so he'll be sacrificing his reputation that way. Okay, so... I get that. I'm going to throw something at you that I know that you've thought about before, uh, but I'll, I'll kind of build it up. This idea of sacrificing love for honor or duty. Um, the idea that John may sacrifice his love in the same way that effectively he sacrificed his love for Igreet, who was, we got told many times, kissed by fire. So she has this kind of fire symbolism to her. His new love is Danny, again, symbolized by love. Is he going to have to sacrifice her for duty or honor in some way? There are hints. We were talking a bit, a bit before about the in the books with the um, the uh, the House of the Undying. There are hints there that Danny has to be having another treason. There has to be another fire. That there, there, there's there's a whole load of other things going on here. Do you think there's any possibility that John may have to, in some way? sacrifice Danny in a kind of Azor high Nisa Nisa way? No. No, I don't. It'd be more likely to be the other way around, if anything. But I think John and Danny honestly could ride into the sunset together in self-sacrifice. Like, I, I don't think either one's going to live, and they're both going to be laying down their life, but I do not think we're going to get an Azor high Nisa Nisa thing with somebody getting stabbed with a sword, especially not Danny. Um, if anyone... 
does more that more literal type of sacrifice it would probably be melisandre um but yeah, i, I, I would i'm on team no 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 woman stabbing <laughs> at all well yeah i'm i'm also generally not in favor of woman stabbing i i think that i would agree that uh, melisandre is more than willing to die to be sacrificed if she thinks that that will bring about what she thinks is the right end opposing the great other um so let's move on to melisandre quickly so uh, shini donut says melisandre to be preaching to the golden company i think so the question here is really what's going to be going on with melisandre the golden company if you remember they are a sellsword company there's a huge amount of history to them in the books that i think isn't going to be picked up on really on the show but they're coming across cersei has bought them where is melisandre going to be dealing with them or is she going to be going up to the north oh you know i hadn't even thought about the idea of melisandre interacting with the king's landing plot i just assumed that you know she's always been latched on to the magical plot but if she brings over the followers of her lore and any kind of an army or something, well, then they they very much could interact uh, with Cersei's army. And anybody coming from the east is most likely to land in Westeros in the south or the middle, you know, as opposed to the north, especially in winter when the seas are really terrible up north. So, ah, yeah, I have to think about that. Um, that's interesting because we've got, so what are the forces at play in the south? We've got Euron's navy. We've got uh, the, bringing over the Golden Company. We've got a small remnant of Greyjoy forces with uh, Yara and Theon. We've got obviously Cersei's armies, um, and potentially we could have some Relorist freaks with uh, with Infinity Gauntlets. <laughs> we 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 could. I mean, I I think I'm I'm sticking to the idea that Melisandre is going to be impacting on the story with the night king rather than the story with cersei and right. i think that uh, the way that the show has been speeding things up is that she will just appear somewhere i think that's where it's going to be i don't think they're going to show a, a long journey of her coming across and then stopping off at king's landing and then heading up north. i think she's just going to appear again uh, at some point and bring with her whatever she brings with her i think yeah i i quite like the idea that she might appear with Kinvara in some way. I think that given they mentioned Lightbringer, Azora High's legendary sword, and the first time we saw Melisandre, she was telling us all about it and how it's important that, that the prince that was promised has to have this. Uh, the time she saw it, thought it was Stannis, she now clearly thinks it's John. She thinks that John needs to have a fiery sword, and I think that she is going to give John a, a fiery sword. So I think that that is. Uh, that is what she's going to be about. And I think she's going to do that up at Winterfell. Um, but yeah, maybe she will impact on people on the way up there. Well, uh, Robert, what do you think about the idea of ice being reforged? Widow's Whale and Oathkeeper uh, being reforged into <laughs> ice? I think, I think you know what I think about this because I'm a bit of a party pooper. Uh, so th this... Oh, they need m more swords or better because, like, you know, why would you take two swords and make one yeah, sword you, when you, you can have you two swords? You may mock, but you Because be you need a giant as, magical as a sword. General, and because... you'd be rubbish. They've got magical swords. Valyrian steel swords are magical swords. They have not got very many of them on the show. They've got only five, I think, on the show. But what if it they doesn't work all... against Night King? What if, Night... what if you got to have something more dope to beat Night King? That is why Melisandre is bringing her big fiery sword across with her. Uh, oh, she's going to bring a new sword? Oh, yeah. Well, why not? She doesn't seem to think it has to be a specific sword. She she pulled a random one out of a, a fire on Dragonstone. I think she will bring something with her. Cool. Melisandre has dawn confirmed. You heard it here first. <laughs> I think so. I, just, just to sort of pick up on that, yes, I like the symbolism of it. And, I, and I'm very happy to eat, eat my words on this, if, if possible. If there is any sword that they have shown as being in on the show as important and symbolically important, it has been ice. And so if they're going to use a previously symbolically important sword, they will be using reforging ice and reusing it. Uh, and I think that Melisandre could make that a fiery ice. It's not a weapon for use in battles. It's a ceremonial sword. Um, but certainly in the short term, I like this idea of Brienne and Jamie having these two 
swords that were forged from ice, the Stark family sword, and fighting yes. with each other, being joined symbolically I in like that, that way, that that works for me because that just shows their link. And I think that that works certainly up to see episode three, the idea that they're in the battle together with that, protecting the Starks with the Stark swords. Um, and I think that that just makes sense to me. I, it does. And of course, it was foreshadowed in the book in another very long passage, which I shall not read uh, because of that one guy that complained last time I read a long passage. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but you guys do know <laughs> that uh, uh, Jamie does have a, a very important dream, which is part of a turning point for him. It's when he decides to go back to Heron Hall and save Brienne from the bear pit. And the dream that uh, leads him to do that, he has while his head is resting on a weirwood stump. And in that dream, he's in some sort of watery under part of Casterly Rock, and he uh, has a flaming sword, and so does Brienne. And it's the two of them with flaming swords. But the cool thing, Robert, is that the color of the flame is silvery blue, which looks like an icy flame. Uh, so, And then, of course, him and Brienne end up with the two swords that used to be ice. And even though Ned's ice is Valerian steel, it's like that blue icy flame might be a Martin telling us, like, they're both going to fight with two halves of ice. So if if it's not reforged together, I would be still very excited to see Oathkeeper and Widow's Whale in action together. That would be pretty sweet. So and and it is for it's it is foretold. <laughs> I, I I agree. And I love it when you can come up with some imagery that that backs up my flailing around in the air gut instinct on stuff. Um, Jamie McKenna. So a first super chat. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you to my two fave creators. Love all your vids, Robert. Less than three hours to go. Yes, guys, it's true. We are getting Woo. very close to uh, to episode one. We have been waiting a long time. Do you think we've been talking about Jamie? Do you think Jamie will feel compelled to protect John when he finds out he's Rhaegar's son? Uh, this is quite an interesting uh, one. So I think Jamie is going to have huge amounts of things that he will feel honor bound to do. And this is where the idea that he is Oath Keeper now is really going to start coming through. Um, he certainly will feel, I think, some honor, honor bound to protect Bran after what he's been going through. He clearly will be wanting to, uh, I, she won't need it, but protect Brienne. Uh, there's, there's something going on there. I think we've been talking about the protecting the Starks as a whole. The question here is, whether because Jaime was part of the Kingsguard that were protecting the Targaryens earlier when they were on the throne, whether because John is therefore the rightful heir to that, that then means that uh, Jaime will feel compelled to protect John when he finds out who he is. Personally, I don't think that that is going to be a, a specific driver for him. Jamie was only a member of the King's Guard right at the very end. He was only there for, you know, perhaps he was uh, made a member of the King's Guard at the tourney at Harren Hall, and therefore he was only uh, there for pretty much the duration of Robert's Rebellion and the few months before that. During that time, he wasn't one of the, the group that was surrounding Rhaegar. So he wasn't, he was generally kept close to King Aerys because. Uh, the Mad King liked having uh, Tywin Lannister's son near him uh, as sort of collateral because he feared Tywin. And so he kept uh, him quite close to him. So actually, Jamie's uh, interactions with Rhaegar were quite limited. We read about a couple of them, uh, but it, it wasn't that there was some huge bond between the two of them. So I don't think that that's necessarily going to lead to him having some great extra new bond with John just simply because he finds out that he's Rhaegar's child. But is there is there another parallel there that I'm perhaps missing, Armel? Well, no, but I think um, it's fair to point out that uh, Jamie might have had a certain amount of respect for Rhaegar and that might carry over to John. Um, of course, one of the famous interactions between Jamie and Rhaegar is Rhaegar before going off to the Trident is basically promising Jamie that changes will be made in regards to his father's misrule. And so essentially he's showing an awareness that, yeah, his dad's kind of shitty, kind of a tyrant, and yes, we have to do something about it, but I'm going to go win this war first. And then he doesn't. And who wins the war instead? King Robert, who, oh, by the way, has been 
basically committing marital rape and certainly physical and emotional abuse to Cersei for their entire uh, marriage. And who's been sitting there watching it all is Jamie. So if anything, that might affect Jamie to have a little bit of a rose colored memory of Rhaegar. Be like, yeah, he was going to try to fix it, even though his dad was shitty. King Robert was shitty as hell in Jamie's mind. So he might look at John and it's not the same thing as like John Connington wanting to protect Rhaegar's son to make a book analogy. But I do think that that is an interesting dynamic. It could come up. Right? You could see Jamie say something to Rhaegar to help him. I'm sorry. You could see Jamie say something to John about Rhaegar, maybe to help him come to terms with who he is or something like that, perhaps. Yeah, I could certainly see that as one of the people who knew Rhaegar, Jamie, Jamie waxes lyrical about the, the 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 great Kingsguard that there were when he was um, uh, first made a part of the Kingsguard. There were some legendary members of it at the time, and I could certainly see him because uh, John is going to face this. Uh, you know, taking a slight size, different angle on this one. John is going to have this huge existential crisis when he finds out that the man he thought was his father, Ned Stark, the man that he dresses like, emulates as much as he possibly can, quotes all the time, and, and seems to have a lot of the shared characteristics with, was brought up by, he's not actually Ned's son. That is going to have a huge impact on him. And he's going to find out that actually the person who his father is, is someone that he's never met and doesn't really know. And for most of his life, he's only ever heard bad things about. So for someone like Jamie to be able to say, well, actually, you know what? I did know him and he was a really good guy. That I think would be a really important point. Uh, I don't know whether they'll play that up on the show, but I, I do. Yeah, I think that was, that was really well, well said, Elman. I think that it would, it would work well as a character development point because I don't want them just to gloss over this problem that John has that actually he suddenly realizes that he's not the person he thought he was, and or at least he, his heritage is not what he thought it was. That w w should have a huge impact on him. Uh, and one of the person. things we talked to, sorry, one of the things we talked about earlier today on uh, the Lucifer Means Lightbringer channel was the idea that, you know, Martin's recently said the, the books, the book ending isn't going to be that different from the show ending. I was trying to comfort everybody by saying, yeah, it'll be similar, but look how much more the show gives you. Like, for example, John's resurrection in the show was pretty threadbare. Like they washed his hair. Ghost was curled up by the fire. Melisandre said some words, kind of shrugged and walked off. And then he rose from the dead and that was it. And they haven't dealt with the fact that he's undead. They don't talk about it in the books. It's probably going to be a lot more magical. Maybe even some blood magic and fire going on. And John will, we will have to deal with the consequences of him being undead because Martin loves that shit. He talks about Beric and how neat it is that Beric's like losing his memories. And in his fantasy, you can't just come back from the dead. It's not a free lunch. You know, you lose something of yourself. So all this stuff's going to be way different. And this is yet another example of something that it'll be similar, but it'll be really fleshed out. So Jamie and Rhaegar and John and that whole dynamic, this is something that I expect Martin to explore a lot more and it'll maybe just be touched on in the show. And, and that's one of the reasons why everybody shouldn't be too down on the idea that the shows are going to spoil the ending. Like they will spoil some stuff, but there's going to be so much in T wow and a dream of spring. That's really going to be surprising and enjoyable. So. Yeah, I would just echo that. I think it was a really useful, um, uh, thing that George R. Martin said to confirm that yes, the differences aren't going to be huge. There are going to be differences, but I think what we what we're seeing here are the broad brush strokes uh, at the show, providing the broad brush strokes of the ending that the books are going to provide the intricate detail of. So that doesn't mean that everybody who survives in the show is going to survive in the books or anything along those lines. But broadly speaking, it's going to move all the pieces of the plot into the right place and resolve them in roughly the same way. There will be some differences and some of the fun of the last two books is working out exactly what those differences are going to be. But yeah, it's not going to be completely different. Um, Terry Pring, thank you so much, saying, what do you think of the theory that Winterfell will fall and the final Night King battle will be at the Trident for Jon's death to mirror Rhaegar's? Um, yeah, we touched on this a little bit earlier with this question about when the Night King 
is going to be ended in some way. Um, is it going to be at Winterfell, episode three, or is it going to be a little bit further down towards King's Landing? Um, we kind of teased out the idea that both of these could possibly work. Um, they've not done much yet about uh, the Battle of the Trident. So if they're going to do a flashback, they I think they would have to do it about that in order for us to see the importance of the place because they've not really mentioned the place they've not shown the place um uh, that uh, that Rhaegar fell so they would have to tee that up in some way and so Bran would have to see that this was where it happened and then we would have to see that this is where the battle is going to take place again my the only thing this is purely from working on what they've been saying is that the big battle of the season is at Winterfell. That's something we've been told that, that there might be battles later on, but the big battle is at Winterfell. Um, so I think that some things are going to be resolved there. But uh, LML, what do you think? Do you think that we're going to see the Trident and John's death um, sort of mirroring Rhaegar's in some way? Uh, perhaps. Uh, Night King is sort of like an inverted garth figure robert being a garth figure so i like the idea more that they're going to meet on the trident more than you know john will echo his dad well i mean you know i guess that makes sense yeah i mean like i just said john's going to die self-sacrificially so yeah this and in the books um you know john dreams of wearing ice armor when he has a burning red sword defending the wall but then danny has a vision of riding on Dragonback and melting her enemies who are armored in ice at the Trident. So it's like Danny dreaming about the Trident battle, but the enemies are armored in ice and she melts them with dragon fire and it turns the Trident into a torrent. So again, it is foretold in the books that there others will be fought at the Trident and John has the same ice armor as the others in the dream. So yeah. Yeah. I think I, I think what I would what I say is in the books definitely uh, the the focus of a lot of this is in the Isle of Faces and Harren Hall, which is just it's uh, it's on the shores of the lake that the Isle of Faces is in, uh, and the the Ruby Ford, the Battle of the Trident, is again just a few miles away. That seems to be the real focus of what's going on here, and and I think that that seems to if I were to place my money on where a big battle is going to happen or a, the denouement of the story is going to happen in the books, that is where it's going to be. On the show, they have played up uh, three locations above everything else. Castle Black and the Wall, Winterfell and King's Landing. It makes sense to me if they're going to be doing the big uh, conclusions to stories at those places. Uh, and we're, we're definitely going to see something happening at Winterfell. And I think we're definitely going to see something happening at King's Landing. They would have to create a new place for us and tell us why it's important before they can actually do something at it, if that makes sense. Uh, Squid Burritos 42 saying, thank you both for a wonderful answer to my question and first super chat. You're very welcome. Uh, thank you for all you do. I read the books because of your videos. Oh, I, I, I love that. I think this is one of the things that I, uh, this is quite a bizarre life doing YouTubing stuff because it's just, it's as you can see, it's just me in my room talking to a computer. It's the same for LML. And when we just hear... What are you talking about? I'm in space. Look at me. I'm in the space <laughs> castle in the sky. Speak for yourself. Sorry, go ahead. About, well, Ed, um, I'm in <laughs> my front room. Sorry, you just you threw me off my stride. I was, I was in the middle of an impassioned speech about how, I'm well, sorry. I'm how sorry. much these kind of things touch me. But but no. Well, the, look, the, you're the blushing again. Is, no, I mission accomplished. The, the, the point is that I, I love hearing the impact of this. And thank you so much for telling me. It's it's wonderful. Um, we did have another super chat from Scripps to Clips for Series and Flicks, uh, which I can never say in, in the poetic way, but I'm sure it's uh, it's possible. I'll get to it one day. Uh, hey, Robert, been quite a long hibernation for House Bear Island. Uh, this is House Mormont. Will Leanna live? Leanna Mormont, that is. Also, when we first met Danny, she said she only wanted to go home. Will she? And if so, where's home to Danny? Well, I think we picked up in the second half of that a little bit early talking about where 
It's played up a lot in the books, this idea of Danny wanting to be home and home for her. The safe place is this house with the red door and the lemon tree growing outside the window. And that is where she wants to be. Um, so that for her is what home is. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean she's going to end up there. But there is always this kind of tension between her desire to go off and reconquer Westeros and sit on the Iron Throne and actually this desire to just go home for where she was safe and happy. So that's the tension that we've always got going on with her. And my feeling is that, no, she will not end up at home. But um, I will throw the first half of that to you, um, LML, about House Mormont and Liana Mormont, who um, is a bit of a fan favourite, it has to be said. Will she survive? Yes, I would say she's a real good bet to survive. And I, yeah, you don't kill Leanna Mormont. That would be a complete fail. No chance. Definitely she's around. Um, in fact, she's, if the Long Night spinoff doesn't work, they should consider a Leanna Mormont spinoff. I mean, that's, that's, <laughs> that's where it's at. Co-starring Hot Pie. I'd watch that. Are you listening, HBO? Um, but Sheila King, real quick, Robert, has a really cool comment. I'm 38 weeks and five days pregnant and trying not to go into labor tonight. Wish me luck. Game of Thrones <laughs> hype. So good luck, Sheila King. We wish you the Absolutely. best and uh, congratulations. So yes, hopefully, congratulations hopefully hold out till tomorrow. Uh, guys, just so you know, in terms of time, we are coming up to just over two hours before uh, the show. I wanted to keep these live streams to uh, or as close to the two hours as possible. So if you have any final questions, now is the time to drop them in the chat. We'll uh, we'll go for maybe 10 more minutes before we uh, end off. And uh, Alan Mell has been on an epic stint today because he did a two hour live stream before this one as well. So uh, I, I do need to let him get a little bit of a rest before uh, Red the show. Bull comes from a can. It was put <laughs> there by a man. Um, uh, Linda Prasuta, thank you so much uh, for the super chat. So your third very generous super chat, Linda. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. There are rumors that episode one will have more humor than usual. You think that uh, there will be to offset the dark? Yes, I think that's very true. So we've got the shape of um, the the season, as we've said, is that the first half, the first two episodes, things are going to be happening. We have to think about what happens with the Night King's army, but that's going to be largely off screen. Cersei's going to be building her or consolidating her place down in the south and getting the um, uh, the the Golden Company into place and her alliance with Euron being sealed and all the rest of it. But the main action is going to be up in Winterfell. And it's going to be all about episode one. The thing I suspect we'll all come away thinking about are all of these reunions. And some of them are going to be really funny reunions. Uh, I, I'm absolutely sure. Uh, the ones with Arya, I'm sure, will be great. Arya and Gendry, Arya and the Hound, Arya and John, lots of them going on there. Sansa and Tyrion, I'm really looking forward to. But I think all of these things, there's the potential for a lot more humor, particularly as it's going to get quite dark, as we discussed a few of the very dark possibilities. It is going to get a lot darker later on in the season. So I think this and possibly something like episode four or five might be slightly lighter. I could certainly see that a little after the huge battle, I could certainly see them slowing the pace for an episode or so before building up to the finale. Um, but yeah, I agree. There will definitely be a lot more humour going on in this one. What, what do you think? Are we going to finally get uh, the, the Tyrion's punchline to his joke? Um, yeah, we'll get all the punchlines because there's going to be so many awkward situations, um, so many... Uh, you know, uncomfortable meetings from people and humor is going to be a natural way to deal with that. And then as far as the counterpoint to the action, I think we'll get both humor and like John and Danny working out their feelings as they go on their dragon mission to the North and people will be reconciling their differences in between like sword swings. And like, that's, that's how they're going to do it. If they'd have a real skill, they'll weave in, weave it all together and they'll, because that's you have to keep the human heart in conflict at the forefront, even while you're crashing dragons together in the sky. And the way to do that is kind of just what we're talking about. You don't resolve all the issues and then you go to war and sort of have it all be mixed up together. So I think that's what we're going to get. Yeah, agreed. And uh, just uh, very quickly, I saw Joe Magician in the chat. Hi, Joe. Uh, or Matt, Hi, Joe. good to see you. 
um, and uh, definitely have him back on the channel at some point soon. Uh, Midnight Predator 18, uh, thank you for the super chat. I didn't see a question attached to that one, uh, but moderators again um, do let me know if it's there. Um, so let's, while we're just starting to wind down, we, I think we can probably get a couple more questions before we end. LML, do you want to just let people know, um, for anyone who's been entertained by you today, where they can find you on the internet, what to, what to look out for? Yeah, well, come find me right after the show, guys. I'm going to be doing a post-game show. I know there's other post-game shows, so, you know, that's cool. You know, hang out with Smokescreen, uh, hang out with uh, Zora Hype and all them. That's cool. I mean, those are all my friends, too, so... Uh, but we myth heads will be doing our thing on the lucifer means lightbringer youtube channel you can go right on over there after the stream is over and subscribe hit the notification bell so you get a little notification but right after the show we're all gonna be super excited i'm gonna have six or seven other really smart people on with me sharing our rapid reactions and uh you know our show focuses on comparing what we're seeing in the show to what might happen in the books we're all book fans first we love the show too, and we're looking to sort of compare what we see in the show to the books, and that's going to be our general angle. And obviously, we're we're fun people with infinity gauntlets, foam swords, and wigs, and things like that. So come on, hang out with us after the show, guys. And uh, thank you very much, Robert, for having me on. And once again, that's Lucifer Means Lightbringer YouTube channel. Super easy to remember. Awesome, and I would highly recommend uh, checking that out, not just for the the post show live streams but some of his videos uh, as well there's some uh, excellent looking at things from a different angle a slightly more symbolic am angle uh, looking a lot more at the uh, the synergies that are going on across the piece and and the echoing down through history of a lot of george rr martin's languages within the history that he's created um andrew thompson just picking up on what you said in the chat um yes we did answer your question about the um the night king wagging through the tree uh, the short answer is I don't think he uh, did. LML had a lot more wordy answer that I think probably answers a lot more from that one as well. We did um, talk about that, yeah. We definitely talked about that one. Um, and uh, just in terms of after the the show, I'm not doing a post uh, post show live stream because it would kill me because it's uh, it would be starting at like three o'clock in the morning, uh, yeah. and I want to focus some of my time and attention to actually doing a video a breakdown video of the episode itself so yeah, getting, I'm not doing getting that. some sleep eventually uh yeah at some point i wish <laughs> to get some sleep in this life i would recommend going checking out um lml's uh one i also um i promised Gemma i would big up her live stream uh as well which is after the uh um the show uh Gemma, for those who don't know she's been on my channel a few times secret of the citadel Excellent channel, does some fantastic work. I would highly recommend that as well. Why don't you watch them I, both I at the same I second that. I love, I love all Gemma's work too. She's great. We've done stuff together, and yep, just have to uh, bounce around a little bit and share the fun, and yeah, give her a visit too. Okay, guys. So we are coming up to two hours to go. This is your chance to go away, grab some food, uh, and then uh, get ready for the episode. LML, thank you again Woo! for coming on. Uh, guys, if you like these live streams, they'll be this time every week uh, on a Sunday, uh, 5 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, as a pre-show, uh, looking back at the episode we've just had, looking forward to the episode we're about to have. Also, my usual Thursday live streams uh, at 6 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Uh, and I'll be doing videos through the week as well. Guys, if you're not watching this live, if you're watching this a little bit later, just coming up in a moment, there will be appearing somewhere around here, a link to my playlist of all of my videos to do with season eight. And coming up here, a link to uh, my Patreon page, my patrons. Uh, thank you guys so much. I cannot do this without you. I prioritize getting uh, my videos out to my patrons first and also on my thursday live streams they get priority in terms of questions and a whole load of other goodies as well so if you'd like to uh, check out my patreon page uh there's going to be a link appearing up there and also one down in the description guys thank you so much i've really enjoyed this there's been some fantastic questions cannot wait for episode one and i shall see you again next time take care bye cheers